welcome to Canonical. I'm James Schoen. I'm joined by Sam Spieler and Iad Darris. Hey, hey, hey. My name comes first. I switched it up a little bit. It's always Iad Darris and Sam Spieler. I figure, why not give Sam his time in the sun? <laughs> Today we are discussing all three books of our contemporary Chinese sci-fi series. The Fat Years by Chen Kun Cheng, Vagabonds by Hao Jing Feng, and The Three-Body Problem by Liu Cixin. If this is your first time listening to us, you can join our book club discussion on Reddit at Canonical Pod, which you can find by clicking on the link in the episode description below. And if it's your first time, go ahead and subscribe to us. You can look through the books in our archives and find our reviews and discussions for previous books. You can find us on social media at Canonical Pod, and if you want to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link, which you can find in our episode description as well. So I'll start us off here by continuing our discussion from last week when we talked about the fat years. In all three books here, the author presents different attitudes toward the role of the state in the three-body problem. The evil of the world of the novel is chaos manifested in the book as the Cultural Revolution and the chaotic phases caused by the three sons of Trisolaris. Liu Cixin positions the state, both the Trisolaran government and the Alliance of Earth governments, as bringers of order to advance the common good. In Vagabonds, Hao Jingfeng describes an overbearing state that stifles freedom of choice, but it's ultimately a beneficial force for progress, while She acknowledges that some people, like the main character, will be left out of this system. And in Chen Kun Cheng's The Fat Years, he's very critical of the authoritarian state, demonstrating how state propaganda can erase memories and dictate public perception. I thought it was interesting that even though only Chen is overtly critical, and in our last discussion, we even discussed perhaps that he wasn't that critical of the authoritarian state, The question of how much power the state should have and what the role of the state should be is a critical part of all three novels. So part of me wonders if this is because these are books that American audiences want, which is also something we discussed last episode, and that we are seeing a filtered non-representative sample, or if, in fact, Chinese writers are grappling with how much influence the state has with their lives, that they perhaps are not overtly critiquing the state, but they are, in fact, thinking about it. Perhaps not deeply, but they're just thinking about it frequently, thinking about the role of the individual and the state. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with you. I mean, it's true that they all have a representation of the state, but is that really because they're Chinese or just because they're writing a sci-fi novel? I think that this is a pretty common theme in a lot of science fiction. It is, but it's not the only theme. And the problem here is we only have a sample of three. You know, for some reason today, I have Ringworld on my mind, the novel by Larry Niven, and that does not have anything to do with governments or the state. I mean, there are science fiction novels that don't deal with the state. It's hard to say because we really only have a sample of three. To your point, yet, uh, science fiction is often political fiction. I think there's significant overlap. So it's just hard to say. I mean, for me, it's hard to say if this is because it's sci-fi or if it's because this is what American audiences want or if this is because this is something that Chinese writers are thinking about. I also think that the approach to state power in the three-body problem is much more oblique than it is in Vagabonds or The Fat Years. I think the latter two novels really approach that topic very head-on. But in The Three-Body Problem, it is part of the novel, but I think it's certainly secondary to the science. I think the science is definitely in prime position in that novel. And I think that you could remove the themes of state power and the way that a state should work from that novel without changing too much. Whereas if you tried to remove that from the fat years, there'd be pretty much nothing left. Yes, I agree, except for the cultural revolution aspects. 
I think the cultural revolution part of the novel is not so much a critique of the state, but rather a critique of chaos. Mm. But I would say that there are elements of the novel where it feels like the writer, Liu Cixin, inserts the state when he doesn't really need to. Like, for me, the most obvious example from the book is the dehydration and rehydration. The fact that the state can decide whether or not you are useful or not useful, whether or not you should be stored away. That doesn't need to be in the book, but he adds it into the book. In terms of just the scene work, I think it would be difficult for him to negotiate the scenes on Trisolarius with the princeps, deciding how to approach the situation with Earth and how to develop the sophons and all of that, just because you need to have some sort of active voice calling things into action and saying, this is what we're going to do and this is why we're going to do it. If it weren't state authority, I really struggle to imagine what it would be instead. One thing that we briefly touched on last week as well is this idea of chaos and harmony. And I think also you could view all three novels as touching on that theme as well, that chaos is the enemy and striving for harmony is the goal. And as I mentioned in last week's episode, this is a big part of Chinese political philosophy, or at least a big part of traditional Chinese political philosophy. I don't know enough about contemporary Chinese political philosophy to say. All three novels approach that as a kind of a paradigm, a way of thinking about the role of the government. Even in Chan Kun Chong's case, where he's talking about the ability of a government to prevent chaos and promote harmony, he's speaking against it or he's calling into question that goal, but he's not promoting an alternative. He's not saying this is not the only way of doing things. He's just saying when we do this, there is some collateral damage. There are some things that are sacrificed. I think what's interesting to me here is that in all three novels, regardless of their attitudes towards the state, they always fall within certain paradigms that I think are a result of where they come from. Their way of thinking about the state is in a term of this kind of dichotomy between chaos and harmony. And, you know, I mentioned in the first episode, they also all seem to have an attitude towards science that I think is very representative of technocracy. But in the three-body problem, I think it's quite clear. The scientists are the good guys. Uh, the anti-science people are the bad guys. In Vagabonds, I think it's also clear that, you know, Hao Jingfeng is very much in line with the ideology of China. One of the signs that Mars is meant to be a utopian place is that everyone participates in scientific advancement. Nobody in the country is doing service work. All of that is automated. Even in the fat years, which I think is the most critical of the novels, the government power is criticized, but never scientism itself. Even the use of MDMA to control everybody's reaction is never really criticized. It's incidental to the general criticism of the novel. How do you think Dasha fits into this paradigm? Dasha, the policeman in Three Body. I think it still fits. It might seem, yeah, like it undermines it because he's this lowly working class police officer and he kind of shows all of these experts that they're not really as clever as he is. But at the same time, I think that there is a, a space for that in Chinese ideology. Science is king, but the working class are queens, so to speak. Um, that's probably not the right way to say it, but yeah, the working class is still in a prominent position. And he's still operating within scientific means. You know, he, he's a working class guy that understands science to a point. He understands it enough to use the, you know, the concept of this highly technical nanofiber to its ultimate advantage as a weapon. Yeah, that's true. The tools that they use are scientific, 
even if the person who comes up with the idea is not a scientist. Right. He's, he's taking the science to its pragmatic level. And also technocratic doesn't necessarily mean science. It just means expertise. I guess he is a kind of expert or he's at least portrayed as one. I don't believe it, but he's portrayed as one in the novel. Here, I'm going to invite you guys to pick on me because I offered this example from the fat years, but it's the one that I feel least certain of. I don't think it's really important that it was MDMA used to spike the water supply in China. I don't think that's really an anti-science message. I just think it's a, a kind of a shorthand. It's still a form of technocracy because you have He Dongsheng's huge lecture. Once again, it, I don't think a technocratic form of government means necessarily that it's science. It just means that it's um, governed by expertise, by experts in their fields. That's true. But I think that, you know, because of the age that we live in, the particular kind of expertise that's so important to us right now is scientific expertise. Maybe it's overrepresented in these three novels, but I do think that that's a chief concern here in China. But maybe elsewhere in the world, when people think of technocracy, they would think of it in a different way. So we've been talking a lot about the theme of state power, but I'd like to take a closer look at narrative structure here because I think all three of us kind of shit on vagabonds. We had a lot of negative things to say about that, but we had negative things to say about the narrative structure of all three novels, didn't we? Yeah, to some degree anyway. Three Body was more polished in retrospect because the story was very plot-driven. Well, and the way it bounced between eras generally was pretty good, I think. It fell apart a little bit toward the end with that. Yeah. But I, I do recall, at least James and I thought, that it would have been better if it concluded kind of two-thirds of the way in when we reached the resolution of Ye Wen Jay's plot line. I don't know how you felt about that, Sam, but that's the way I definitely felt. It's like that last bit of the novel kind of felt disconnected. Yes. More polished doesn't mean great, though. It's it's better than Vagabonds, but I mean, Vagabonds was like, what, a three? This is probably a six Yeah, on a 10-point scale. Yeah. The first two thirds of that novel are definitely better than the last third, but you still need... In order for him to move things into the next books, the things that happen, at least some of the things that happen in the last third have to happen. But I agree. It would have been a different novel, but there definitely was a point where it got a lot sillier. I think for Vagabonds, the narrative problem for me is that the main character that we meet in the first part, Echo Lu, just disappears. And then he's replaced with other less important characters that I remember James was really unhappy with. He really didn't care about their love lives at all. And then when we read The Fat Years, the problem that I had is it has this very interesting premise at the beginning with this missing month, but then it moves on and it focuses on a love story. And then it has this kind of political essay at the end none of it seemed to cohere. So the reason why I think this is interesting is because there might be a difference between Western and Chinese narrative structure. I was trying to figure out if my distaste for these three novel structure was just my own personal taste or if it's a cultural difference. And I found two conflicting reports. I found a critic called Huang Yonglin who wrote that Chinese narratives try to be complete. They try to have a beginning, a middle, and end that are told in chronological order. And that beginning has to go all the way back to complete the whole story, including not only the basic stuff, but even stuff like when the character was born and where he was born. He also wrote that these narratives are built from separate and self-contained units to accommodate an oral tradition where a storyteller could speak and stop 
and complete one part of the story rather than asking a listener to remember something. Maybe he'll tell the second part of the story on the next day. The listener wouldn't remember and the storyteller wouldn't remember either. Finally, he also wrote that narrative fiction in the West uses flashback and other techniques that are nonlinear to focus more on theme, to connect things and heighten the thematic impact of the plot. On the other hand, I found kind of a contradictory report from a Chinese writer called Tian Jianan, who says that these seemingly unrelated details and these self-contained units that we find in Asian narratives don't exist for the sake of completeness or storytelling, but because they don't build towards an eventual climax in the way that a Western narrative does. Instead, what she says is that they interact between themselves to establish kind of an extra textual notion or an idea that's present in the reader's mind throughout the entire story rather than emerging at the end, which I thought was an interesting way of thinking about it. I'm not sure if it really applies to these novels, though. Do you think either of these, either Huang or Tian's ideas, really apply to the novels that we read? Well, I don't think Huang's ideas apply to Vagabonds, and I don't think it applies to The Fat Years. But I definitely don't see it in Vagabonds for the simple reason that, according to Huang, you get the whole story at the start. And one point of suspense is you don't know why, and I don't remember the main character's name because I wanted to just erase that book from my memory, but we don't know what happened to her parents. Mm-hmm. You're talking here about, uh, what's her name? Exactly. Loying Sloan. Yeah. Yes. You could make an argument for it in the three body, but the three body is, it is very Western in its plot. So I'm not sure. I, I, I'm on the fence about three body. Maybe Huang's ideas don't apply only because it's notable that the initial scene with the death of uh, Ye Wenjie's father was in the middle of the narrative when Liu Cixin wrote it, and then Ken Liu actually moved it to the beginning to put it in chronological order. So in a sense, you could say that Ken Liu, an American Chinese, made it more Chinese than Liu Cixin. I'm not sure if that's too much of a stretch or not. More and less, because he bounces between those narratives, which feels like a Western thing. But you're right that making it more chronological, at least at the beginning, would make it more Chinese in this way, in Wong's way. But I actually, to answer this, I tried to look up exactly how it was structured before in Chinese. And I couldn't find a definitive explanation other than that all of the Cultural Revolution stuff was in the middle. But I don't know if that was given as one giant chunk or if it was still interspersed a little bit. It feels to me that what Huang is talking about here is not really contemporary Chinese literature as I know it, but perhaps an older form of Chinese literature. Traditional narratives? Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not so old. Maybe even up to like the 1970s or 80s. But Chinese literature from the last 20 years has been heavily influenced by Hollywood. Do you think that the effect of this change is an improvement? Do you think that it's better to maybe trade what we could see as completeness for heightened themes? I'm definitely biased in my Western view, but uh, I will say that reading these accounts, especially the extra textual, ideas from Qian. Both articles made me realize that I do have a very definite bias, and it's hard to judge a narrative structure when you don't understand the cultural background of that structure. It definitely made me appreciate them more, even though I still don't think I'm wrong, but maybe that's just because I'm not used to this style. It does seem to be something that's baked into the culture. I think that Chen's ideas really work well with Vagabond, specifically the thing that I think really 
pissed James off the most is that the love triangles that we see at the end of the novel, maybe in the last third of the novel, seem so pointless. I think both of you didn't like it, but I think James really hated it more than Sam. I was kind of indifferent because I thought the whole thing was a turd and that was just one part of the turd. But if we're charitable, I think that we could read them towards something like what Chen is describing. The triangles seem unrelated to the Earth versus Mars themes, but the tension between the love triangles and the different ideas about love and the different ideas about whether living on Earth is better than living on Mars kind of work together simultaneously to present this idea that in our teenage years, that's the time when we're all evaluating ideas, not only political ideas, but also personal ideas. So I think it does express sort of a human truth in this kind of space in between these two seemingly unrelated things. But even if I do that, which is, I think, a very charitable reading on my part, I still think it's underwhelming because I still feel like this method of establishing a theme or a mood without pointing more explicitly like we would find in a Western narrative can't really point very specifically. We can't point towards anything other than just kind of a general cliche or a truism. I think Vagabonds, to me, was the only actually subtle book to Chion's point um, in its discourse style. But I also think that it suffered because of that, or or it suffered in its aims at subtlety. But I, it's not just that it was aiming for the subtlety and what it found was blandness, but it also did so with poor writing, with poor prose. So it, it kind of had double knocks against it. I wonder if a better writer could have worked all of those things together, could have worked with the love triangles to make those work a little bit better thematically. Okay, well, let me ask you here. What is it that prevents them from not working? Is it that they don't seem connected to the other ideas? There is some missing connection, but I, I think you're right. I don't think the tensions were lacking. In fact, it's probably the opposite. What we're given is a lot of information about feelings and tension and strife. We're led by the hand the entire time. Yeah, I agree with you here, Sam, because what Chan is talking about is this very elusive way of writing with an A, elusive. And I wouldn't describe vagabonds as being very elusive. I think the problem is when you try to write this kind of novel, this novel where these images or descriptions lead to feelings, atmosphere, and how these different feelings kind of build on each other to create a mood, which becomes an idea, you have to be really careful with your language because you can't have stray images that muddle it up. So... Hal's problem is that she has too much. You read a passage in one of our episodes, I think in the review, where she just describes someone looking at something and someone else looking at something else. You can't have all of that. You have to have a very kind of spare style where the words create meaning. If you have too much, then the meaning isn't created. It's destroyed because it's too diffused, if that makes sense. Her problem is not that she lacks it, it's that she has too much and it becomes confusing. In that review, what I called for is an editor, but not an editor to change her writing, an editor to cut. Like, what she needs is significant cuts. Sort of what Sam is saying, um, it's the prose that's the problem. Now, the problem is, we're talking about narrative here, but a narrative structure that is elusive, has to rely on prose. The prose has to be really pitch perfect. If the prose isn't pitch perfect, you can't have an elusive narration that works because the illusions don't work. You need to have good prose. Maybe I'm just being semantic here, but if we're saying that it's fundamentally a problem with her prose style, then we could say that, in fact, there are no narrative problems with the novel because 
if her prose style were more specific and less kind of scattered, then the seeming disconnection between the love triangles and the love feelings of these teenage characters would be clear in its connection to the Mars versus Earth idea. Can we evaluate narrative and prose simultaneously? Can we evaluate them separately? I'm not sure. I mean, the example I always go to is Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, because Gilead is a book without much plot, but the prose is fantastic. And it's that kind of novel. It's an elusive style. When you read it, it's like a meditation. And the reviewers who praised Hao Jing Fong said that it was that kind of novel. It wasn't that kind of novel for me because the prose didn't work. So for this kind of novel, it goes hand in hand. If you were talking about a thriller or something like Three Body Problem, the prose can be separated from the narrative structure because the narrative structure is so plot-driven. But in a novel that is supposed to be meditative, you can't really distinguish the two because the movement of the novel is the idea, is the atmosphere or the mood. So you need the prose to move it along. Well, maybe here I'm just being overly analytic, but just humor me for a second. Is there something separate from what you're talking about Marilyn Robinson doing in Gilead that is different from what Chen is describing in her essay? Is it the same thing or is it something else? Because it seems to me, you know, we're all three of us reading Nabokov's Pale Fire right now. That's also a very, very richly written novel. The prose is very, very beautiful. But I'm not sure if I would say that it's similar to what Chen is describing. It's hard to say because Chen isn't, well, first, she's not only talking about Chinese novels. She's talking about Asian novels. So I'm thinking about Murakami because doesn't she also mention Murakami? At the beginning, yes. Yeah. And Murakami, to me, does not feel very different from other Western writers. So I'm drawing on that because my sample that I can rely on here for this you know, argument or for her, uh, for what she's describing, is limited really to Murakami, uh, other Japanese writers that we read, like uh, Tawada, and the very few Chinese writers I've read. I mean, just to be clear here, though, when she mentions Murakami, she actually makes the point of saying that her friend is wrong because her friend says that Murakami is very Japanese, but she thinks that he's much more Englishized. That's the the description of his prose style. Englishized. She uses the word Englishized. Englishized. Yeah, yeah, Englishized. I think the example that makes more sense, I, I don't think any of us have read it, is Junichiro Tanizaki's The Key which is written in the form of a diary, two diaries, a husband and a wife. And there is this kind of intertextual, extratextual idea, rather, that emerges in the reader's mind in between these two diary entries, which to me, it seems quite different from Pale Fire. And I haven't read Gilead, but it seems like it might not be there in Gilead either. I'm not sure. What I'm trying to get at is, is this thing that she's describing something new to us, or is it just being a really good prose stylist? It's difficult to answer because to answer it satisfactorily, you have to kind of be either an expert of Chinese literature or to come from China and understand the language of Chinese literature the way that Qian does because she is Chinese. I mean, in a way, I'm, it's a cop out, but I can't answer this question because I'm not well-read enough in, in Chinese literature to say whether or not Hao Jing Fang is a good example of this style of writing or if she's not. That kind of brings up another question that I have. James, you were particularly pretty hard on the quality of writing in China. And I'm just wondering if that evaluation or other evaluations have a place in what we could consider more of a quote-unquote separate but equal realm of cultural difference. In general, can we as Americans evaluate Chinese writing when it emerges from a different cultural tradition? I would say yes, if informed. It would have been great to have read these articles beforehand 
I think maybe I would have been able to appreciate these novels a bit more. However, the prose would still be an issue. Again, we're talking about narrative structures, and the prose is a separate issue. Even with that, even with this extra textuality, I keep coming back to certain characters in Vagabonds that I never felt like we needed to know them inside and out. Having them as background characters was okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something culturally, but I I don't see what those perspectives add to the overall story. I definitely have a greater appreciation of Vagabonds, especially if you view this from a historical point of view of chaotic Earth and peaceful, harmonious Mars, and seeing that dichotomy of the benefits of both is actually interesting um, in the context of Chinese history and Chinese politics. But the problem is, you know, the question, should we have greater appreciation for it? I think we can't escape our lens through which we read fiction because it is what makes who we are as readers. And I suppose it'd be great if we could somehow, when we read works in translation, understand the context of that writing with the native lens. But it's impossible. It's it's asking for an impossibility. So it's almost something that, you know, you acknowledge, but you acknowledge that you are not from that country, which we did. I think in our first episode, we talked about how we were not Chinese. So um, even though I am Chinese American, I'm not Chinese raised in China. So my point of view is that of a person who is a Chinese American, not a person who is Chinese. I, I think that acknowledging that is important, but I don't think there should be an expectation beyond that, that you need to have this native lens. I don't think you need to have a native lens, but I guess what I'm calling into question here is this kind of evaluative statement that you said is, you know, writing in China is generally bad. Sure. And I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I'm just kind of saying, you know, on what grounds can we say such things? Because there is this idea of cultural relativism, and this idea says that, you know, basically what we want is what we want, and we can't judge what other people have created according to what we want. And I think that that is reasonable, but in kind of the globalized discourse of literature nowadays, there are foreign writers who want the same things that we want. And I think Murakami is probably the best example of that. I think when he writes, he has in mind some of the same goals that we have. But I think that when we do evaluate foreign literature, we have to start by expressing our values. And we have to say, what do we want as readers? What do we want to get out of this novel? Or if we're writing something, what do we want to achieve from this novel? And we also have to admit that not everyone has those same values. Now, here, I I have no idea what Hao Jingfeng wanted to do, but perhaps she was aiming for something quite different from what you would expect from a Western novel. In that case, I don't think we can criticize her in the same way that we would criticize an American novelist. But isn't this implicit in what we do? I imagine that anyone who is reviewing a book has this understanding that they are evaluating it from their own lens. Like, if you are reading a review created by Virginia Khan, you're reading Virginia Khan's take on the book. I mean, it's implicit. There is no global lens, right? Like, if I read a review, I'm understanding that it is this person's bias that I'm reading. And you can strive for some kind of universal stance or positioning when reading the book. But in the end, if you're making an evaluative stance, it's implicit that your evaluative stance comes with your bias. I would say yes, but I would also say it's kind of like decentering the idea that the Western novel or the American novel is the standard, 
and other novels are either trying to attain that standard or are subcategories of the novel. I think that when we enter into an evaluation of a work, it is fair for us to say, well, I don't like this as a Western novel or an American novel because it doesn't satisfy theme the way that I want it to satisfy theme. But if we could say, well, I do enjoy this as a quote-unquote Asian novel because it has the subtlety that I want from an Asian novel. I think it's fair, but I think that asking people to you know, put those distinctions at the forefront is basically saying that the Western way of doing things isn't always the right way of doing things, and it's not the only way of doing things. And yes, of course, I think when people listen to us and when we speak, we skip that a lot of times just because it's easier, but perhaps we're not doing things fairly when we skip that. I agree with the basic premise that maybe there is a separate but equal kind of cultural difference. And for sure, we are not voices of authority. We are <laughs> three people that have read some books and went to school reading books. And that, that is our authority. Uh, it is not absolute by any standard. But I think it is fair to judge uh, different aspects of the quality of writing and point to things like the narrative structure and say, okay, here is where our cultures are divided. And maybe I can't speak to the narration as well. However, I don't think the prose style is an aspect of that. I think it's completely fair to say, this is not good prose. This is not good sentence level. Um, I'll say editing, because I do remember there were things in how Jing Fang's writing that I thought, oh, this is good, especially coming after the dryness that was um, Liu Qixin's writing. There were definitely things that made me stop and say, okay, I like this. But on the whole, it really needed an editor. I don't think that's a cultural thing. Maybe she's got fans in China, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. I agree with you abstractly yet, by the way. I'm not actually disagreeing with you. I think abstractly it is good to decenter oneself and to learn about other points of view. But if we move from the abstract to the practical, my point is that it's not practical. But anytime you read a review, you know that you're reading it with some implicit bias. Like, it doesn't even need to be said. A reviewer does not need at the beginning of the novel to say, I'm reading, um, let's say, I, I want to pick like a non-English writer. I'm reading um, Blindness and I'm not Spanish. Therefore, take it Portuguese. with a grain of salt because it's implicit. Like, you know that this person is reading a work in translation. You don't need at the very start to say, I may not fully understand, um, oh, sorry, did I say Spanish? Portuguese. Right, I may not fully understand Portuguese and Portugal and all the tenant cultural bits of this novel. I mean, you don't need to say it. it. It's implicit, right? Like that's part of understanding that this person's background is different. So yes, I totally agree with you from an abstract point of view as an intellectual exercise. From a practical exercise, I see it as like honestly a waste of space for a reviewer or anyone to really acknowledge it. Because it's implicit, like people know that unless the reviewer is very, I don't know, anti a certain cultural practice. I mean, I suppose there are certain instances where this would need to be addressed. But let me ask you, Iyad, do you feel now, after having read these two essays, do you feel that you should retract your assessment of vagabonds as a turd? No. I don't think that these positions that I'm taking here should ever silence a person from expressing an opinion. But I think what we do need to know is that when we have an opinion, that our opinions are founded on certain assumptions, and it's valuable to take the time to examine those assumptions and to discuss them at a certain length. 
not at extensive length, but perhaps at a certain length, just because I think it will clarify how we feel and how other people feel. And it may help us to see particular errors or blind spots in our own ways of evaluating things. I think that what you're saying is true in terms of, you know, two people just chatting on the street about a book. Is this book worth reading? But I do think if you're saying, yeah, it's an assumption that you can just skip, on what pretext does uh, Chen Jianan write this article? Like, why does this article need to exist if what you're saying is correct? I think that, yeah, we can assume it, but it's always worth taking a moment to just stop and say, hey, just the way you think about it is not the only way to think about it. I want to jump in here and throw a wrench in this uh, conversation a little bit. The Chiana article made me start to think about those Japanese novels we read uh, at the beginning of this project. I was trying to compare them, compare the Murata and Murakami and Tawada to these three, but I'm struggling. I, I don't really know how much there is to compare. Uh, I know you guys both didn't really like Murata very much, but to her credit, that novel flowed fairly well, and it kept a succinct structure without much wasted breath. And I kind of hesitate to draw too many comparisons from Murakami and Tawada because of how international those two writers are, um, even if they write about very Japanese themes or ideas. But I don't feel that any of those books really fit into Chian's points about narration, though Tawada maybe comes the closest. Do you think it's fair to place those Japanese books in the same category as these Chinese works, as East Asian literature in the same way? I feel like a lot of Chinese scholars would take issue with how she's lumping things together. I agree. Yeah, I think that the idea that Chinese literature and Japanese literature are of some greater whole is not something that I am sure is true. Yeah, I while I was thinking about this, I had to reread parts of her essay to make sure that I wasn't assuming things, that I wasn't assuming. But it, it does, right in the title, talk about East Asian literature. I think it's not necessarily in my reading, at least, the same, just because there is an attitude in Japan that is much more outward-looking than I think China is. I think China still thinks of itself in an inward way, or it thinks of itself as the center, like there's enough to look at here that we don't need to look outside of ourselves. And I think that Japan is so outward-looking that their modern fiction is really very influenced by foreign literature at this point. Well, that was part two of my question, is that the Japanese don't really have to worry about censorship in the same way that the Chinese do. They also don't suffer from a difficult-to-penetrate bubble of state-run media or information. So there's another parallel that is not really there, uh, stripped away. So with all that said, are there parallels between these books that we've read, stylistically or otherwise? I would say very little. When I think about Murata, I think actually I liked her more than you probably let on. Like, maybe I don't love her, but I do think that she's an interesting writer. And, you know, she had a new novel that came out last year that I'll probably pick up at some point. But, uh... I think that she's much more irreverent than any of the three Chinese writers that we've read. Even in terms of like um, Chan Kun Chung, who's very outspoken in terms of criticizing state power in China, he's not particularly irreverent. Like, I think that his attitude is still kind of stodgy and old fashioned. Yeah, I actually felt the same way. I'd probably say that Murata is a better writer than the three we've read. Tawada, on the other hand, like she's on another plane of existence when it comes to writing compared to these three. Like she's, in my opinion, certainly a master. Like her prose is so good 
And it's so exciting to read that it feels like we can't even talk about her in the same breath as we can talk about like Hao Jing Feng. It's just no comparison. Right. I mean, that's that's kind of what I was getting at is that she and Murakami are very international in the way they talk about things. But yeah, you're right. Tawada, the way she plays with language is is completely different. And it's hard to put her in any sort of category as the others here. When I think about these three Japanese novelists, it doesn't seem central to their personas or the way I think of them, that they're Japanese. I know a lot of people, they think about Murakami as like the quintessential Japanese writer, but to me, he exists as an individual. And it's not a privilege that I necessarily afford to the Chinese writers that we've read. And that might be unfair of me, but when I read these science fiction writers from China, it remains clear in my mind that they're Chinese. And they may want it that way, but they might not as well. And I'm just wondering if I'm being unfair. No, I don't think you are. I think Murata, though, did feel Japanese to me. And the short story I read of hers afterward uh, also felt peculiarly Japanese. But in general, I agree that certainly Murakami and, and Tawada didn't jump out as these are Japanese writers. Certainly not the way that these three uh, Chinese books felt very Chinese. It's not entirely unsurprising, right, with how insular China was and still is in many ways? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about whether we have room for more Chinese sci-fi on our bookshelves. So after reading these three novels, do you want to read more Chinese sci-fi? I would. I mean, I was disappointed by some of the things that we saw, but not enough that it would make me put all Chinese sci-fi aside. I think there are some really good ideas that we saw here. I would, but I don't want to. Like, (laughs) I would read it. Uh, I probably will read it, but I'm not particularly interested in the novels as such. What I'm really more interested in is Chinese literature becoming part of world literature. I'm interested to see how that will pan out because I think that Chinese state control is preventing that from happening because the views that people can express are very limited. And I think that in order for people to enter the stage of world literature, They have to be fully fleshed out, realized human beings, warts and all. And I'm not sure if that can happen. Yeah, James, you mentioned the more quiet novels that we're not seeing uh, that don't get translated. I, I would love to see those. And those probably are not going to be the science fiction. Well, I mean, like I said, Moyen's not bad. I think he's overrated, but he's not bad. For me, I would, but actually very similar to Iad, I would, but I probably don't want to because the chief draw of science fiction for me is the ideas. And the ideas present, it seems to me, in a lot of Chinese sci-fi is the scientific ideas, but that's not what I want from science fiction. I don't want scientific ideas. I want political ideas or philosophical ideas that's what I like seeing in science fiction. And I don't think we'll see that because of the government control that he had mentioned earlier. 
Do you think these three novels represent the scope of science fiction in China? Is there something that we've missed? You know, I actually think that if we had gone with short stories, we might have a much better representative sample. My sense is that Chinese short stories are where it's at, and that perhaps we need to go there for our series, because I, you know, I made this comment before. I am not sure that the novel form is the right form. Yes. Well, maybe that's for a future series, Chinese short stories. I'm thinking about if I should explain why, because I don't know fully why. I think a part of it is because so much of Chinese fiction. Comes from the science that over a long narrative, the science becomes tedious. Whereas in a short story, you introduce the science; it's there, and then you can get right to the tension or the plot or whatever. I think the reason why short fiction might work better in the Chinese context is that the kind of feeders for the publishing industry are these online web novels, and all of it is basically fan fiction, like it's written by non-professional writers. And for the non-professional writer, the demands of a short story are much, much more approachable than a novel. Like I think that the person online publishing to the Tsinghua University forums can probably manage a good short story or two, but asking somebody like Hao Jingfeng to write her first novel, probably she's not up to the task. Yeah, I agree with that, and Chen Kuncheng as well. I mean, he's written several novels. I don't know why this novel was. It wasn't especially bad, but it could have been much better. Well, this was one of his earlier ones, though, right? Yeah, he's written two or three since the newest one. The premise sounds interesting, but that's the trap, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> the fat years sounded interesting. All right, let's conclude here. Thank you for listening. Next week, we'll be moving on to our next series, Obsession. And we'll be starting with Nabokov's Pale Fire. Or is it Nabokov? I always say Nabokov, but Nabokov, I think, is correct. Nabokov. I've heard it both ways. You got it. You heard it both ways. Yeah, I usually say Nabokov, but I've heard Nabokov. It depends on how pretentious you want to be, because I feel like Nabokov is more pretentious. So I guess we'll go with Nabokov. <laughs> Come join us on Reddit if you want to talk to us. You can find our updated reading schedule there. You can find this discussion there as well, and you can chat with us about what we got wrong or what we got right. If you would like to support us, you can find our bookshop.org page, which is in our episode description. And if you want to find us on social media, we are at CanonicalPod. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. 